Good morning, and welcome to the Greater Albuquerque Church of Christ. Now, I don't know if you can tell or not, but we just rolled out of bed, and we rolled right into church. I mean, is this awesome or what? I got my coffee here, hot black coffee. I'm in my jammies. Check out these jammies. These are awesome. And now we get to have church together. I'm so stoked. This is incredible. I'm in my jammies. You're in your jammies. I got to tell someone. Hey, hey, neighbor. Woo! It's house church. Honey, get, get back here. What's the problem? Um, I need to share a scripture with you. Have you not read Proverbs 27, 14? If a man loudly blesses his neighbor early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. Ah, oh, man. You blew it. I totally blew it. Well, you know what? Don't do what I just did. But be pumped up like I'm pumped up. Because we're having church right now. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you that we can have house church like this. Help us to enjoy it. Help us to feel your spirit move in our lives. Bless our service today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I forgot to tell you, we have a guest speaker today. Guest speaker? Bill Molden will be speaking to us this morning. What? Bill Molden? That's incredible! Woo! Whoa, whoa. Right now, though, we are going to watch a good news video from Los Angeles. Good news! Just be hard, somehow blind. I can never find what I was searching for. Disciples are responding to the need right now in the current crisis. Wendy and Carly Hammond have been asked for their local school district staff who are distributing over 20,000 meals daily. Cheryl Edwards and her 91-year-old father, Dwight Goins, have made also hundreds of masks to distribute to local firefighters and different healthcare professionals. And our IE Hope chapter, along with Emma Pineda, have made 5,000 masks for local hospitals. God is also working powerfully by drawing people near to him. Veronica Martinez was baptized on good Friday and Jasmine Roscoe was restored on Easter Sunday. God is so good. In the midst of this pandemic, our best news is baptisms. Just a few days before social distancing orders began, Maria Huerta, who works for the San Gabriel School District, was baptized on March 10th. On March 23rd, Denny Bethencourt completed his studies virtually and was baptized by his recently baptized roommate. On March 29th, Paul Trevino was baptized in our Glendale Young Professionals Ministry. His girlfriend at the time is now also studying and wants to be baptized. On March 4th, Cindy Rodriguez, wife of new Christian Jose Miranda, was baptized. Then, this past weekend, Aida Ruiz, mother of new Christian Joshua Ruiz from the Spanish Millennials Ministry, was baptized. And Carly Rodriguez, daughter of Martina and Sandra Rodriguez, was baptized in our teen ministry. Summer going to senior year, I found out my dad had cancer, and then three months later he passed away. At that point, I like realized what what was there, and I realized I wasn't living my life the way I should. And, and what is your good confession? My good confession is that Jesus is Lord. In the past three weeks, we've seen Martin Pineda and Dana Newell baptized into Christ. We've seen our sister Kyung Hui restored to the fellowship. And currently we have over 40 people studying the Bible across all of our ministries in Orange County. It's been amazing to see various small groups and small business owners coming together to make encouragement packages and masks for local medical professionals. And to highlight a group of uh, single women in our congregation, known affectionately in Orange County as the WOW Women, praying fervently for all of the needs inside and outside of our congregation. I'm excited to share with you how in the last few weeks, 
God's Spirit has moved powerfully and added nine new brothers and sisters into our fellowship. Chris Spencer, Diego Vargas, Ethan and Hayden Collarbaum, Michelle Lim, Gustavo Duarte, Diane Seri, Haley Gonio, and Luke Blakely. We're excited to see what God's Spirit continues to do. We are so proud of the singles ministry in our region. They are developing incredible momentum with their faith. They're hosting weekly Zoom prayer calls or meeting after every lesson throughout the week. And currently they have 17 Bible studies going on. And one of them recently was baptized during the quarantine. That's Shamika Enos. And now she is one of 30 that are attending the Young Christians class every Friday evening. In our campus ministry, they've been hosting Zoom Bible talks over the last three weeks. And out of that, two women are currently studying the Bible. We've been very fortunate also to open our temporary food bank that we've been able to serve people in need. Finally, we have seen two couples get married, Anthony and Kiana Day and Angel and Kristen Vasquez. Wanted to share with you about a woman named Madison who found us on Google. She found Jesus, she got baptized, then she shared her faith with a woman named Tina who worked at Starbucks. Madison then moved to Sacramento, but Tina months later decided she needed to find God. She came to church and she got baptized last Sunday. Just said, God, I want to thank you so much for this amazing and beautiful journey that you have taken me on. Because all my life, there's been a part of me missing. And now I know all along it was you. I finally listened. Finally, after all these years, I was able to hear you. Thank you for never giving up on me. You are amazing and loving and I just feel so lucky. And I am yours. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, you give life. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. together you give life you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great
And all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing Great are you, Lord And all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing Great are you, Lord. And all the earth, and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Good morning, Greater Albuquerque Church of Christ. Uh, my name is Bill Molden, and I am so thrilled uh, to have been asked to come and share a message with you guys. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Petersons, for uh, uh, giving me this chance. Josh, you the man. You run too much, but I love you anyway. Uh, so grateful for all the great friendships there. And I love the fact that many of you who are watching this morning have no idea who I am. That is such great news. Uh, my wife, Kristen, and I uh, led the church in Albuquerque uh, from 98 to 2011. And uh, so all the old people in the congregation, those are my people. Uh, we had hair back then. We, uh, we had crooked teeth back then. Uh, we had uh, pepper in our, uh, in our beards instead of salt. Uh, it was glorious. Uh, and uh, to catch you up on uh, Kristen and I, uh, we're now in St. Louis. Uh, we had, uh, when we moved from Albuquerque, we went to Chicago and had an amazing time in Chicago. We had an opportunity for, uh, for me to only, not only grow as uh, my ministry as a teacher, but uh, we ended up leading a really large region, uh, and it was the west side of Chicago. So I got a chance to really grow and, uh, and ministering to the inner city. I uh, had a fantastic time there, uh, learned a lot. Uh, and, then, uh, and then a need and the Heartland family of churches came up, uh, which is kind of the Missouri, Kansas, Arkansas, uh, a little bit of Nebraska. Uh, and this family of churches, was ha which has a lot of young church leaders, uh, we were kind of brought in to kind of add some just maturity, which can you believe that? They brought me in to add maturity. <laughs> Hilarious. Anyway, uh, it's, uh, but it is a distinct pleasure uh, to be able to uh, share a message with you. Uh, let me catch you up on my girls here a little bit. Uh, all of my children were born there in Albuquerque, um, and, uh, and this will blow you away once I get a chance to show them to you here. I know, right? They're women. <laughs> Yeah, these are my daughters. Uh, Gwendolyn in the middle is a junior at KU. Emily, who's to the uh, left or the right, I'm not sure how it's mirrored on the screen. To the left of her is a freshman at KU. And of course, Haley is a junior. And uh, man, they are the reason why I am bald. I mean, good night. Look at them. Uh, they are amazing disciples, every single one of them. They're doing fantastic. 
you know, and it's kind of fun being at this stage of life, you know, because Gwendolyn, especially, she's kind of at that point where she's, she's like ready, you know, and she's starting to say things like, man, I wish these brothers would start shooting their shot. And of course, uh, that gives me the opportunity to tell her, well, honey, if you want them to shoot their shot, you got to stop playing D1 defense. Can I get a witness? Ha! <laughs> anyway, uh, but they are doing awesome and they miss you like crazy. Uh, they look forward to, uh, to getting time there in Albuquerque and who knows, uh, we may swing through uh, here this summer if uh, COVID continues to, uh, to unleash its burden on us. Uh, but uh, guys, thank you once again. Uh, special shout out to Tim who's going to take this and try to make something valuable out of it. Uh, just love you guys so much, every one of you. Uh, and uh, just owe you guys so much uh, as uh, this sermon today really is a reflection of things that I began to learn there. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you for being a church that launches people to help other people be great disciples. And so with that, let's start with a prayer and then, uh, and then we'll dive in. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be before you. And God, we are all feeling the effects of life in quarantine. Even as uh, Tim and I were joking around, the reason why they call it COVID-19 is for the 19 pounds you gain. <laughs> Simply because we're slowing down and we have nowhere to go. And Father, and it's in these moments that I think that you want us to pause and quiet the distractions and really have a moment to listen to what's going on inside. And Father, I pray that today as we explore the things that are going on inside, you really will lead us to the main thing, the main truth that we need to have, not just to come through uh, quarantine well, but to live the rest of our lives well. Father, I owe so much to this congregation, and I pray that uh, the what I share today will feed their souls, because their love and their support has so fed mine. So God, be with me as I speak. Let every word and every thought from my mouth bring you glory and honor. And Father, please forgive the weakness of my delivery and use it anyway, just because you're good like that. Father, we thank you, and we pray this on your son's name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I've had the privilege of doing, uh, especially in Chicago, is get an opportunity to work with various uh, uh, uh academic schools uh, like Harding had a great relationship with Chicago. And of course, I, I still work with the uh, Rocky Mountain School of Ministry. And all of these things have, have really kind of opened up circles so that I could get exposed to and, and meet uh, great new uh, influencers uh, who are awesome. Uh, one of my favorites uh, is, a, is an old uh, college professor. He's, he's, he's gone from us now, but uh, you know, he, he told this story um, that uh, I dearly loved. It was a point in time in his, uh, in his family's life where his son was graduating from high school at the same time that his daughter was graduating from college. And of course, you know, in this moment, you kind of get one shot to give the best gift, right? And so he, uh, he had this little Yiddish poem that was super meaningful to him. And so he went and sought out a, a calligrapher who, and found some old parchment paper and uh, had the calligrapher write out in beautiful script this poem. He then went to a thrift store because he, he wanted to kind of give the air that this was something of ancient value. And sure enough, in the thrift store, he found some old picture frames, not very big ones, but big enough to cover this little poem. And uh, he frames it and, uh, and he was able to place these things, you know, in a, in a little box. You know, you kind of, you get the idea. It's not, it's not a huge portrait. It's just something little, something that they could place on their desk, something they could place on a shelf. 
but something that he wanted them to always see it. And so you can imagine the day comes where they're celebrating the, uh, the, the graduation and all the gifts are on the bed and it's at the end of the party and, you know, mom and dad are up there. And, and of course, the kids see the little box and they know that must be the big one. That's from dad. And so they open up all the other presents. And, you know, the family was great. The extended family friends, you know, giving them small gifts of, of money and cash and, you know, a toaster and, uh, you know, socks. I don't know why you would give a graduate socks, but that's what he said. Uh, but, you know, so they're, they're opening all this up. But, you know, you can read their mind. You know which present they're the most excited about. It's this little box that came from dad. And so they finally get to it and they decided to open it at the same time and they open it up and the, the, the son goes, dad, what is this? And the father said, well, it, it's a, it's a poem. He, well, what do I do with it? He goes, well, you read it. Go ahead, read it, son. And so the son reads it. And then the question comes, well, do you get it? And the son's like, no, I, I, I don't get it at all. And then, of course, he turns to his daughter. You, you, you just graduated from university. Could you explain it to your brother what it means? And she's like, Dad, I don't get it either. And, of course, you know, the, the, the kids not wanting to hurt their beloved dad's feelings uh, kept it. Although he's not even sure they ever really quite got its message. Even though it sits in a place of prominence. Uh, it sits on the son's desk and everyone who sees it, he shows it to them or comes into his office. He shows the poem to them. It, it sits in the a prominent place in the living room in the daughter's home, but he's not really sure they ever got it. And the poem was entitled Dear Ikka, which is Yiddish for the main thing. And I understand why they might not have gotten it. I mean, take a listen. It says, if your outlook on things has changed, this is not the main thing. If you feel like laughing at old dreams, this is not the main thing. If you recall errors of which you are ashamed, this is not the main thing. Even if you know that what you're doing now you'll regret some other time. This is not the main thing either. But beware, lightheartedly to conclude, that from this there is no such thing as the main thing. This is the main thing. Do you get it? It's easy to miss. And as I think about scripture, the, the good news is, I think many of our biblical heroes struggled with, well, what is the main thing? In all of our searching, and all of our, our exploring of our faith, you know, it's easy to miss, you know, what, what is it that God wants? Am I doing enough? Am I gaining enough? Am I influencing enough? Is this the main thing? It's, it's an easy concept to miss. And I think one of my favorite stories, one of my favorite things that illustrates this is the story of Elijah in his journey to discover the main thing. So if you will, you can turn over to uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, and I'm going to look here in verse 1. You know, we don't know a lot about Elijah's or origin story which I think is brilliant. You know, in fact, the first time we meet him, it's kind of in this crazy nuclear situation. I mean, check this out. It says in uh, uh, 1 Kings 17, verse 1, Now Elisha the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gal uh, Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Did you catch that? I mean, 
we don't even we have never heard of this prophet until now and then the first time we hear about him here he is this this old wiry guy we don't know if he was actually old or not but just roll with me here it's this old wiry guy who sticks a bony finger in the face of the king of israel and says unless i say so god's judgment on this land of sending no rain is going to happen boom he shows up, drops the mic, and then leaves. Woo! I mean, he confronts the king to his face. And we don't, we don't have any idea and, uh, of where this guy comes from. And then, and then something interesting happens. Did you catch it? It says, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And, it, 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 and, a, you know, and a careful Bible reader goes, so what about before then that's the beauty of it we're not given any indication that elijah had a conversation with god we're not given any occasion that he was told to go confront ahab uh, in fact this kind of opens up some of the reasoning why james in uh, in the book of james would say elijah was a man just like us and i think that's awesome because that means we're living in a time when, you know, we see a lot of crazy going on. I know in St. Louis, you know, when we made the move, we thought, you know, because we were doing deep West Side ministry, inner city ministry, and it was really tough. And so when we kind of thought, when the invitation came to move to St. Louis and come down and kind of serve as, uh, you know, to, as kind of a teacher, mentor, uh, discipling other church leaders and things like that, we kind of came down and thought, oh, yeah, well, we're moving from, you know, kind of an inner city uh, situation to a nice suburb. <laughs> it's funny uh, because uh, we actually live in, uh, in a place that is super tough. In fact, uh, since in the 10 months we've been here, two stray bullets have hit our building. <laughs> That's awesome. And I think Elijah was looking at a world almost as crazy as the one we live in. And he took a stand on God's word. He, he says, I, I know that it would be easy to try to write off that the things God said are not going to come true. But Elijah took a stand and then the word of the Lord came to him. And then we have this amazing story. I mean, you know, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to, uh, to talk about the entire story, but man, what comes next is the stuff of legend. I mean, Armin. Brother, man, can you believe Armin is a minister? Oh my goodness. I remember when that dude was playing high school football as a quarterback. And uh, I remember meeting him at a graduation party before he ever studied the Bible. Man, and now he is a preacher of God's word. You go, boy. Man, I love that. Anyway. You know, I'm going to leave a lot of the stories out, but guys, if you want to hear the greatest spiritual smack talk of your life, you've got to spend time in 1 Kings 18. But that, that is not the interesting story to me. Elijah would go on to confront not just the king this one time, he would go on to confront the entire nation. You know, chapter 18 highlights the fact that that uh, he at one time had a showdown between the false god of Baal and, of course, the god of Israel. And he totally showed out, and God showed off. It was amazing. But the challenge we face is what he faced next. In 1 Kings 19, if you would like to turn, uh, turn with me there, you can, but I'm going to share my screen again so that we could all read it together. Take a look at what happens after this great showdown. In 1 Kings 19, it says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. 
So I know if you're new to this, you might not have caught everything that's going on. But trust me when I say to you, Jezebel was a corrupt influence in Israel. Ahab married uh, a high priestess of Asherah to unite uh, two empires, the, the, the kingdom of Israel with the kingdom of Phoenicia. And this marriage actually made Israel one of the most influential uh, nations around, but it came at a deep price. Anytime you compromise, there is always a deep price. And Baal worship and Asherah worship, uh, which with all of its immorality and all of its child sacrifice became the norm. And so when Elijah shows up and he, he faces down all of that, oh, Ahab immediately comes and reports to his wife just how empty and just how powerless her gods were. But instead of feeling, feeling defeated, Jezebel gets, gets more determined and starts making threats. And when, when these threats start to come, you can almost expect Elijah was expecting this newly repented nation would surely come to his aid. But when Jezebel gave an order, even after being shown that her gods had no power, no one came to Elijah's side. So he was afraid and ran for his life. Now check out what it says next. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom tree and sat under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he fell down under the brush, under the bush, and fell asleep. Have you ever said that prayer? I have had enough, Lord? Yeah. I think we have been there. And if you haven't been there yet, chances are at some point, Granted, it might, be, it might not be to the point where you feel like you want to die. But I'm telling you, sometimes you get to the point where you feel like, man, God, I don't know what you're up to. But I've had about enough of this. And look how God responds. At once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some baked bread over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then laid down again. You know, I actually love the, uh, the 84 version of the NIV because it says it was a cake of bread, which obviously gives me the opportunity to make the joke, see, here's the first mention of angel food cake. But obviously the new NIV kind of took that away from us. But look at what happens here. You know, Elijah's had enough. He's tried his best and he's like, I forget it. I'm not, I've not gotten anywhere. I'm done. It's over. I just want to die. And of course, God goes, no. It sends an angel to say, no, get up and eat. And then God feeds them and, and, and refreshes them. And then he lays back down again. Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by the food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Terub, the mountain of God. There he went into the cave and spent the night. The very place where God reached out to Moses becomes this new journey that God wants to take Elisha on. Because if you're not sure what the main thing is, you have to have a moment where God gets a chance to define it. And here, Elijah's ready to quit, and God's like, no, I'm not done. You're not done. And he starts to feed him, starts to nurture him. You know, he starts to, starts to give him what he needs. And then after that second time, you know, he's now strengthened by the food. And God takes him 40 days and 40 nights away from the ministry that he was called to, away from the confrontation that he had given his life to, and sends him to the very place where it all began. And once he gets there, he goes into the cave. Now watch what happens. And 
and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Do you, do you, do you, see, do you see what's going on here? Elijah's in a cave, and God says, what are you doing here? Then Elijah starts to, to repeat this, this resume. I've been zealous for you. I, I, the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down their altars, and put your prophets to death. Everything that you stand for, God, they just reject. Everything that you want, they just reject. And worse, I'm the only one left. I'm the one standing up for you. I have stood as your messenger. I have stood as your, as your mouthpiece. I have, I have tried to give them and to get them to come back, and now they're trying to kill me too. Nothing I've done, nothing I've done for you has made a difference. You start to see that for Elijah, the main thing was seeing a certain amount of success, a certain amount of impact, a certain amount of, of reward for my effort. I want to know that God, if I stick my neck out for you, you're going to back me up by making some changes. And at this point, Elijah wasn't seeing it. And now you understand his brokenheartedness. What he thought was the main thing turned out not to be the main thing. And then in verse 11, the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there came an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled the cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And I think we're starting to get a clue to what God thinks is the main thing. We get this idea by God's simple use of language that these amazing displays of power did not equate the main thing. Why? Because even if the wind breaks apart the rocks, God's not in there. Even if there is an earthquake that shakes the mountain to the very core, God is not in the quake. Even if a fire sets the whole thing ablaze, God is not in the fire. So where is God? What is God into? Where is the Lord? And of course, you hear it, don't you? What are you doing here, Elijah? Because God was in the cave with him. God was with him. Think about it. Hasn't that always been the thing? When God made man, God was with man in the garden. When man became corrupt, God was with Noah through the flood. When God's people needed to be delivered, God was with Moses before Pharaoh. And when the people came out of Egypt, God was with the people as he, take, as he took them through the sea. 
And as they came through the sea and eventually got to the land, which that's a whole story in and of itself, God was with them as he brought them into the land. And then, of course, even as they took over the land, there became moments of, of failure and of disappointment and letdown. And then God shows up and says, I am with you, Gideon, mighty warrior. God was with David before the, before the giant. God was with David on the run. And God was with all of us as we kind of like the psalmist in 139 would say, man, even if I choose to go into the darkness and, and, and turn all the light around me into dark, if I just try to get away from God and say, God, I, I, I love my sin more than you right now. And we try to cover ourselves with darkness. The psalmist says, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day for darkness is as light to you. Oh God. And of course, Israel would discover the profound nature of that when they realized even in exile, God would go out of his way to message them saying, I am with you in exile. Then of course, as they re returned, they returned knowing God is with us in return. And of course, the great ending of it all for the disciples on the mountain was the words, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And oh, how the early church would love that reality. In fact, Paul would capitalize on it saying, hey, well, if God is with us, who can stand against us? You are more than a conqueror. So what is the main thing? I think it's just simply that God has made his decision. He is with you. Elijah replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, and put your prophets to death but with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. I think in repeating the same thing, Elijah was saying, I don't know what to do with that, with that reality, God. It would be so much easier if you would just come in the wind and break things apart. It would be so much easier if you would just grab hold of all the evil in the world and shake it. Man, it sure would be so much easier if you would just set all of our enemies ablaze. I don't know what to do with the fact that you're with me. And then God does something amazing here in verse 15. He says, go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. There, anoint Hazel. Also find Jehu and anoint him. But this last one, anoint Elisha. Anoint that young man because he is going to succeed you as prophet. Do you see what happens? In this moment where Elijah is confused about what to do with this reality. Okay, great. You're with me. So what do you want me to do? He goes, I want you to go and find not, not ones, but a few. In fact, he really just points out, I want you to go give your heart and to give your life and to give your spirit to one. It's amazing to me that after all of this dis demonstration and this newfound teaching that God is with you in the cave, what God wants is for you to go find one and get into a discipling relationship. Isn't that amazing? And why would that happen? Well, because God says, well, I'm going to use those other two jokers, kind of clean house. And if they don't clean house, Elijah will finish the job. But yet look at how this uh, little story ends. Yet I, have, I reserve 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, whose mouths have not kissed him. Listen, there are thousands out there, Elijah, but you know what I want you to do? 
I don't want you to focus on the thousands that need to be gained. I want you to focus on one. One. God is with you. And you might go, great. So what am I supposed to do? I think from this great story, we see well, what you do when God is with you, you find one to one another with. You find that person that you kind of go, hey, listen, man, I don't want to stay in this place any longer. I know there are thousands out there that need to be reached, but I know that God's plan was never to just go and try to gather all the thousands. His plan was to be way more relational. It would be Jesus who would demonstrate that perfectly as he spent not just time, but years with his apostle, spent apostles spending all that time training, showing, demonstrating, giving to them so that they might know how to give to other. The thousands were out there the whole time Jesus was teaching and preaching, but he knew that that was not going to be how the thousands are reached. They are going to be reached through this very intentional thing called discipling. And I love that the most evangelistic thing you can do no matter where you are, no matter where you're at, is to find one that you can one another with. Is to find someone to open up the book who will give space for there to be honesty. To find someone who will, who will, will point you to the truth and give you some reassurance that even if you tried to hide yourself with the darkness, God was not fooled by that. You turn to darkness because you're looking for something in the light and Satan has created a perfect distraction to keep you from finding the main thing. We need to grow in our confidence that discipling really is the only response to the main thing. I am with you always. Those words came as the ultimate end and the ultimate motivation for the great commission to go and make disciples. Everyone needs to find one to one another with. And as the story illustrates, because that's where you'll get the thousands. It's the main thing. Not the stuff that we're called to do in action, but it's that reality that everywhere we go, there is this little, little poem that the Father in heaven has given us. This constant reminder that right here, right here, God is with you. Right now, God is with you. And when you grab onto that and you start to wrestle with that, the thing that God would love for you to do is go find one to one another with. And if my language is confusing on that, the New Testament has all these passages on how to build a relationship with one another. So just go on Google, type up one another passages. You'll get it. You'll get it. But the main thing with the right response will lead to thousands in this city who are just waiting. Brothers and sisters, I hope this has been an encouragement to you. I hope the editing that I'm able to do to this will make it smooth. But even if it's not, just know Kristen and I adore you. And we're so proud of you. Thank you for your faith. Thank you for your love. But keep the main thing the main thing. God bless. At this time, we're going to take communion together so uh, you can get the elements ready, the bread and the cup. I'm going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 2 uh, just to prepare our hearts for this time together. 
Paul says here to the church in Ephesus, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. You know, it's so encouraging that we can continually be made alive through Christ, thanks to God. All of us at one time objects of wrath, all of us suffering the consequences of our sin, but God loves us so much. Let's really focus on that at this time as we take the bread and the cup together. And uh, after I pray, we're going to listen to a song together. Let's bow together and pray. God, thank you so much that you love us so much. Thank you for the thoughts that we've heard from Bill today, and I pray as we take communion now that you just really encourage our hearts with your love and your mercy and your grace. Thank you for Jesus, for his sacrifice for us. Help us to be thoughtful and mindful of that as we take communion together this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. message. Thank you so much, Bill, for the many years you and Kristen served here in the Albuquerque Church. We are very, very grateful. Hey, for the week ahead, we want to let you know about a couple of things that are happening that are really important. Uh, this Wednesday, we are focused on uh, some of our third world churches and some of the things that are happening around the world during this COVID time. So I want to ask that you do three things for me this week. Number one, I want you to either go to our uh, website abqcoc.com or to our Facebook page and we're uploading a 19-minute video uh, from some of our brothers around the world who want to share with us what they're going through and what it's like right now uh, in this COVID time. I want to ask that you watch that video as soon as possible but definitely before Wednesday night. Uh, second, this Tuesday Hope is actually hosting an amazing event and we're going to watch a video about that at this time.
Hi, I'm Cameron Shelley. I'm Kate Bergeret. And I'm Caden Rasmussen. Our Hope Worldwide Global Network is responding to needs around the world. In South Africa, food and supplies have been provided for nearly 7,000 families. Funds have been sent to Bolivia, El Salvador, and Nepal for those facing extreme food shortages. And we're excited to announce Sing Hope, a Hope Worldwide COVID-19 relief concert. The concert will feature several of your favorite artists from around the country, as well as various speakers within the Hope Worldwide community. Your donations will help provide immediate food, medicine, personal protection equipment, and other resources for those in dire need during this pandemic. Please join us for our virtual concert, Sing Hope, on Giving Tuesday, May 5th at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Click the link below to donate now. So that's going to be awesome on Tuesday. I really want to encourage you to be a part of it if you can. Every week we're trying to have content in our church throughout the week. Uh, that empowers us and helps us as we continue to shelter in place. And I think Tuesday night's going to be really, really encouraging. And then on Wednesday, we have our congregational Zoom midweek where we'll be discussing uh, both the video that we're uploading to the website and what we saw on Tuesday night. Please join us uh, Wednesday night uh, back together for midweek. Yeah. And next Sunday, we'll see you back here for House Church. House Church! That's it? Mm-hmm. Oh, boy.